Hi, thank you for joining us today. I am Jenna Mills, Director of Alumni Engagement Programs and a proud 2009 and 2016 graduate of Towson University. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on investment planning strategies. Joining me today from the TU Alumni Relations team to help with this presentation is Steve Rosenfeld, Director of Alumni Communication and Recognition. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanna share a few housekeeping notes. This session is being recorded and it will be shared with all event registrations once it is finalized. Attendees will remain muted for the entire webinar. If you have any questions, please use the chat function in your window and direct your questions to all attendees. Frank Sneeringer, TU Director of Major Gifts for the College of Business and Economics will be helping with the question and answers today. Frank will be monitoring the questions throughout the session and we will also hold a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. I'd now like to introduce our speaker, Jason Edelson. Jason is a 1999 TU grad. He's a private wealth advisor and executive director at Verdance Capital Advisors, a nationally recognized private wealth advisory and multifamily office firm with approximately $2 billion in client assets. He is responsible for providing oversight and specialized support services for clients' investment and planning needs. He previously worked for Wells Fargo for 12 years and is a multiple time recipient of the Concord Elite Award, which recognizes the top producing and service advisors nationwide. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jenna. Happy to be here. So welcome everybody and thanks for attending the, uh, the webinar today. Um, we're going to cover a, a wide variety of topics today. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we're going to talk about uh, investing during a pandemic, uh, since that seems to be the, the hot topic on everybody's minds lately. Um, but then from there, we'll also talk about uh, different types of investments, such as uh, IRAs, different strategies you can take with IRAs. Uh, we'll talk about you know, investing in 401ks uh, for our, our newer graduates and some strategies you can take there. And then happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. And again, uh, Frank's going to assist with with those questions. So, um, with no further ado, I think we can uh, we can get started. Can everybody hear me? Okay, Frank does not. I can see you. If if so, all right, very good. Uh, we've got a, a saying they can't see me. Yeah. Frank, can you see me? Okay. I can, but do you have to? Change that. Okay, <laughs> they can see me. All right, we'll just get started. Good. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so um, one of the most let's start with the pandemic, and really one of the most important things to remember at a time like this is things are going to change, and that's kind of got a, that's going to be a theme of what I talk about today. And that's really the rate of change. And we have to look at the rate of change and why that's important. And what the what is the rate of change in the economy? Right? What is the rate of change in science? What is the rate of change in, in the political environment? And these three topics seem to be the big three. And those are what impacts markets, and those are what really impacts the economy. Now, I won't get into any political discussion today, and I, I won't get into right versus left or who's right and who's wrong. Uh, but traditionally, politics don't have a direct impact on the market. And really, they have more of an impact on, on a long run issues for the market. Uh, the markets look at earnings and the economy. And right now, we're at an extraordinary moment where a small group of people are in control of a vast amount of the economy. Uh, so let's dig in where we are right now and where is the rate of change right now. So I thought I'd start by, by giving you all some perspective. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see the chart that I have up right now on the screen. Um, and what everybody fears is, is what you see here. Uh, this is, Jason, the, the screen actually has not popped up yet. It is not. Okay. Still nothing. Yes, still nothing. Um, so try to share it one more time. Okay. There you go. 
Okay, now we got it. Sorry about that. I was never uh, never confused for a technology guru. So I apologize. Um, so what we see here is is what everybody fears, what every investor fears, and this is a significant downturn in the market. And in this particular case, by looking at the numbers, you can see that we top out at about 340 and then drop down to 220, which is a massive drop off in the market. Uh, but most importantly, what you can see is that there's one moment where this massive pullback takes place. And the question that I ask is, does this look familiar? And the answer is, it certainly should look familiar because this is exactly what we just went through back in March when we bottomed out on March 23rd. We saw spectacular moves in the market and there was even some days with uh, 10 plus percentage moves in one single day. Uh, and this is what every investor fears. Uh, having our money invested and then having this stunning drop and losing our value and then this kind of grinding along over time with, with no real recovery, right? The market hits the bottom, there's, there's, it's slow and steady, but there's no, there's no immediate bounce back. And I'm sure people have heard of different types of recoveries, uh, whether it be a V-shaped recovery or U-shaped or L-shaped or even W-shaped. Uh, these recoveries are exactly as they sound. So with a, with a V-shaped recovery, the market drops very quickly and then rebounds very quickly, which, if you're going to have one, that's nice to see, right? You drop and you go right back up. With a U-shaped recovery, like what you see here, the market drops and then it lingers around the bottom for a while and then slowly begins to recover. But obviously, this creates a bit more pain for the investor because the markets are down for a longer period of time. Uh, then you have the L-shaped recovery, and that's where markets drop and then never recover. Uh, and this, there's always some expert in a bear market that says we're in an L, but in these circumstances, there's a bias towards short-term investing, and the bias is to get emotional. And that's one of the things we'll talk about today is, is short-term versus long-term investing as well. So human beings by nature, they wanna end the pain when they feel pain. So when the markets are under extreme stress, humans by nature, they wanna eliminate that pain. And how do they do that in the stock market? They sell, and that is a short-term fix. So the reality is, is, as human beings, we crave tangible evidence. We crave evidence that we can hold on to and that we can create certainty around. And that, again, is a human condition. So that's what makes investing so hard. When things are up, you want more and more and more of that investment uh, because tangibly, things are great. And when you have a crash like the one you see on your screen here, the pain is so hard and so tough to deal with that our human condition just says, get me out. I wanna end this pain. So a lot of people will get out and sell at this moment. And look where we are now. You know, people think to themselves, look, look where I am now, and then they look backwards. But when it comes to investing, you have to look forward. Looking backwards is not gonna do you much good. And I kind of use the analogy of, of driving a car, right? If, if you're driving a car around a big turn and you are looking at, the road just in front of your hood, you're constantly making adjustments to make that turn, right? Versus if you were to lift your head up and look at the apex of that road or the apex of that turn and look at the road ahead of you, you automatically make that turn without having to make a whole bunch of adjustments to your steering wheel. And that's a lot harder to do, but it takes a certain level of confidence. And as we look at investing today and the change investing, we have to keep in mind one constant, and that is we have to be strong in our resolve around our long-term investments. And here's what I'll share with you about this chart. The, the chart you've been looking at, it, it actually is not what just occurred in March. This is actually the 1987 crash. And what you see here is a 25% drawdown in one day of the S&P 500. So yes, that was a one day drop. Uh, and this is unprecedented, right? A drop like that or almost unprecedented until you look at what's happened recently uh, in March. So let me, let me share with you my, my next screen. And what you're seeing here, another chart, still the S&P 500. Uh, but if you look at the circle on the far left of that screen, that is the previous chart that we just looked at in the context of time, okay? So as you can see, the U shape that we saw on that short-term chart suddenly it looks like it's not that big of a deal. 
it looks like we came down and then ever since had a nice steady climb. And in fact, the S and P was around 200 at the time of that crash. As we where we stand today, the S and P is now over 3100. This is a massive increase that a long term investor has enjoyed over the past 30 plus years. And just to throw some statistics at you, if you were the most unlucky investor, right, and you invested your money on the day before that 1987 crash, your rate of return would average 9.8 percent annually. Again. If you invested the day before the market crashed, 9.8% annually. If you had invested on that same day and added money to your portfolio after that drop, which is always the hardest thing to do because, again, you want to get out and end that pain, you actually would have averaged 10.5% annually. Now, again, this doesn't sound like that big of a, of a deal, 9.8 versus 10.5%, but when you compound that over 30 plus years, it makes a large impact on, on a portfolio. Now, I get it. a lot of people may say, I don't want to wait 30 years for a return on my investment. So let's take a look at a market cycle, which we define as a 10 year period. So, again, if you take the same scenario and invested your money the day before the 1987 crash and saw the single worst one day drop in the history of the S&P, your return 10 years later, if you would have just stuck it out, was 16.3%. If you invested the day after, it'd be 18%. So, yes, my advice is not to invest your money the day before a market crash, but my advice is to maintain a long-term perspective. And if you invest in equities, you will obtain a higher rate of return if you maintain that long-term perspective. If you take a short-term perspective, that's where you can get your portfolio into trouble, and this is where risk takes over because you have risk versus volatility. And let me just quickly explain the difference between risk and volatility. Volatility is just the movement of money up and down. So if you have a stock, right, and it goes from $20 a share down to $10 a share, but it ends at, it ends up at $40 a share, you're still making money. The, the movement of that money from 20 down to 10 back up to 40, that's just volatility. It's just the movement of money. On the other hand, if a stock goes from $20 a share, drops down to $10 a share, and you panic and you sell, obviously you've lost money. That is risk when you've actually lost your, your money and your investment. So with all this in mind, let's take a look at what's happening uh, today with, with the economy. Um, obviously, we had this massive shutdown, uh, which forced a disaster for the economy. Uh, this was nothing short of remarkable. Uh, and regardless of how you feel about should we have kept things open or should we continue to keep things closed or slowly reopen, what we do know is we need to protect those that are most vulnerable. We need to protect those with pre-existing conditions. We need to protect the elderly. So that's one thing that we do know for certain. What we also know is that we're, we're in an unsustainable situation. We, we couldn't continue to go on with the economy completely closed down. So the, the question is not if we reopen, but more so how we reopen everything. And obviously we're starting to see that happen. Uh, so the chart you're looking at on the left goes all the way back to April 1st. And again, keep in mind the market bottomed on March 23rd. Uh, I can tell you that that's when there was the least amount of hope, March 23rd. We didn't know how long the economy would be shut down for. You know, you heard it could be shut down for six months, possibly 12 months. Again, we just didn't know. It was all just hearsay. There simply just wasn't enough information and data to, to, to go off of. Furthermore, the models that, that we were seeing, they were showing deaths that were going to be in the millions in this country. Uh, luckily, the models proved to be wildly inaccurate. And if we fast forward to May 15th, which is the chart you see on your right, you see the states have started to reopen. Some were still in a complete lockdown, while a couple were fully reopened. Um, some are slowly reopened. Uh, fast forward again to today, uh, you know, a month later, and we've seen more states reopened and also have loosened restrictions. And uh, we've seen that in Maryland, and we have another restriction loosening up uh, come Friday at five o'clock. I, I know that like gyms, for example, are, are able to open up Friday at five o'clock. So I ask, what's changed? And between now and, you know, April, when we were, you know, at our bottom, or March 23rd at our bottom, and, and what's changed is that, is that we have more knowledge, right? Back in early March, 
people were saying, it's fine. You know, come on out, continue to go to restaurants. It's okay to shake hands. You don't need to wear a mask. There was no social distancing guidelines in place. But today, people are much more respectful and we do have these guidelines in place. And I get it. Not everybody is going to be as respectful as the next person. That's just what happens and it's human nature. However, what we do know is that people now understand what they're dealing with. And we should not see the same level of cases increasing now. And here's why, you know, we believe in adaptation, entrepreneurialism and in innovation in Americans. We've always believed in situations like this and we take it on. We make the necessary adaptations. We find a way and we're doing that now, right? So we've put plans in place. We've adapted and we've, we've seen a decrease in cases. And I know that there's some states out there right now, such as Florida and Texas and California, where cases have began to rise again, but you know, hopefully it's, it's going to start to subdue. And for the majority of the states, we are not seeing an increase in cases. Okay, going to the, uh, to the next slide here. What, what you see here is some early activity of, of the economy. Uh, Jason, particularly, yes. Jason, yes. I'm just following up on your first slide. Someone had a question. Did you take into effect inflation? Was that based strictly on annual return? This, this is strictly based on annual return. Okay, I just wanted to make sure so we didn't get past that slide too far. Thank you. Sure. Nope. Thanks. Thanks for asking. No, this is this is just year over year return, not not accounting for inflation. Um, thanks, Frank. And please interrupt with any any more questions. Um, but what we're looking at here is specifically I talked about the economy, you know, reopening, and what you're looking at here is is recent activity, specifically air travel. And this chart shows TSA checkpoints. As you can see, again, we bottomed out in early April, and you can see this, this chart, the chart is starting to rise. We're not back to the 600,000 we were at in mid-March before everything shut down, but we're well off the bottom of under 100,000 that we saw in mid-April, and we're almost up to 300,000. And actually, this chart is from May 16th, so um, these numbers come out daily. We probably are over 300,000 at this point. Now, again, we are not seeing the 2 million that we were at from this time last year, but we've made a, we, have, we still have a long way to go. But the good news is we are seeing change and the economy is starting to pick up. Take a look at another slide. And this is the gas demand, right? Again, we saw a bottom, right? When everything got shut down. And again, we're still not where we were at this time last year but the rate of change is starting to pick up. You know, if you've been out and about lately, you'll see that there's more cars on the road. You know, if, if, if you were out at all, you know, when everything was shut down, there were very, very few cars. I mean, you could get from point A to point B almost without seeing any, any traffic. But now this is, you know, gas consumption is back up. There's more cars on the road. That's a good sign. People are going to work. You know, some people may be going to, to stores since they've opened up. Uh, this next slide is uh, Google searches for VRBO. Now, the, the early stage of a recovery for people going on vacation obviously starts with them searching for where they want to go and where they're going to stay. And you can see, again, that collapsed. That has now started to come back somewhat quickly. And one of the big questions was, will people go out when they're allowed? And as you can see, yes, they will. And those numbers are starting to increase. So again, another positive for the economy. Uh, this next slide shows consumer confidence, and as you can see, consumer confidence took a massive drop, uh, you know, back in, in March and April. And again, it's no, nowhere back to where it was, but we have seen a spike, and it's almost like that V-shape we talked about earlier as far as that recovery goes in consumer confidence with still a long way to go. And then lastly, this is the last slide I'm, I'm going to share with you, but what this slide shows you, and I'm not going to go through it year by year, but this shows every single event, every event driven bear market and how the S&P has responded 12 months later. And again, if you just look down at the bottom of that chart, you can see the average decline for these event driven bear markets was a drop of 20.6% on average. However, the following 12 months, the return was positive 30.1%. Let me put that in perspective for a second. This year's S&P pullback was the quickest ever in the history 
to, to reach negative 30%, taking only 22 days to be down 30%. Since the bottom of March 23rd, the S&P has rallied back 37%. So again, is that too much too soon? Possibly, that, that is a massive recovery very quickly. So is there more pain? Possibly, but what the markets have realized is all the projections that were out there weren't the the results weren't as bad as what was expected and what was projected so the uh the rate of change in the economy is still in its very early stages right we're not out of this by any means we still have a very long way to go but what is moving quickly is the rate of change in science uh, currently there's more than 100 drugs in the testing phase right now to fight this virus and what i can tell you is that when every mind in science is working on the same goal and being funded by massive quantities of money. When human beings collaborate in that kind of spectacular way to solve a problem, there's an extraordinarily high likelihood the problem will get solved. It may not be tomorrow, but it's being worked on and it will get solved. So science and technology are both moving very fast and that is in our favor, and this is great news. Uh, this coupled with the knowledge that we have of not standing too close to each other in large crowds, not shaking hands, um, you know, if, if you're sick, we're going to stay home, which we should do anyway, regardless of if it's the coronavirus or not. All of this is, is from a positive rate of change in science and technology. And as for politics, we'll let, we'll, that'll play itself out. Again, we're not going to discuss that too much. Let's hope, that, let's hope that as the data and evidence improves, we open more of the economy, which again, we're already starting to see. And remember one thing, the market is a forward forecaster. So there will be winners and there will be losers in this economy. And we are looking at this every day. And some of these winners and losers may not be who you think they are. Remember, obvious winners in this economy so far have been Amazon and Zoom, right? But those stocks, they've already moved. So when you look at the ones that have been hurt the most, you know, will airlines recover? Will hotels recover? Will banks recover? These are the calculated risk versus return bets that investors must make. Right? So change is constant. We have to know what's changing and how fast it's changing. But what's most important is not to change the core of what we do and what we do every day and what we always do. And this is to be disciplined and not follow that human instinct of buy when everything is super high and sell when everything is super low. Again, things are improving. The market is identifying that. Um, the market may not be totally in line with all the businesses out there and how you may personally feel, but let's also remember that the S&P 500 is not the United States. Uh, the S&P 500 is largely driven by five stocks, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's still not opportunity out there. Um, there are still investment opportunities both in the public and private markets, and what I would encourage you is to remain positive and stay long-term focused. And one thing is for sure, as I would tell you, is, is don't, don't try to trade this market and, and don't try to time this market. Have a long-term perspective, stay invested, and stick to, the, stick to the plan that you laid out before this pandemic ever occurred. So that is my, my piece on, on investing in a pandemic and, and why to be long-term focused. If, if there's any questions around that piece, I am happy to entertain them now. Um, if not, we can you know, talk about some other, other investment ideas. Jason, one question came over was, is the stock market, uh, the, the rebuttal of the claim, the stock market is not the reflection of the economy. Can you explain that a little bit? So the, the stock market is not the reflection of the economy. So sure, I mean, we, we still have, uh, you know, when you look at the economy, we have to take unemployment in, in, into consideration, right? We still have a, law, a, a massive number of Americans that are, that are unemployed. So again, what, what I, what I, talked about in kind of my, my last piece there was the market is not the United States. It, it is not the economy. However, it's a forward indicator of what's to come in the economy. So yes, there's, there's a number of businesses that had to shut down. Yes, there's a number of businesses that have not reopened yet. But, and look, let's face it, um, some of those businesses won't survive, unfortunately, because they're gonna have to shut their doors. However, not all businesses are gonna have to shut their doors. You know, and just because uh, some businesses do end up closing down, unfortunately. Obviously, the stock market is not going to stay at these depressed levels that it was, right? Again, remember, market is a forward indicator. 
And what that means is the market starts to improve before the individual investor starts to improve. And that's why I always tell everybody, stay invested and don't get emotional in a time like this. Because by the time, if you were an investor who was to liquidate his portfolio back on March 23rd or even on April 1st, before we had this massive rebound, you sold and you realized those losses. If you got emotional because you felt that you just couldn't feel that you couldn't stand that pain anymore, it was just too much for you to take and you sold, I, I understand it, but that was a move you make. By the time you feel better about getting back into the market, if you felt that much pain to get out of the market, the market has already made its move. You've already missed your opportunity. So even though the economy may not be back on solid footing where it was you know, back in January and February when consumer confidence was high, when unemployment was around, you know, three and a half percent, the market is going to react to to the the upswing of the economy before the actual economy gets there. Um, Jason, the next question is, what would you say to people who say the market is too optimistic about a V-shaped recovery in the economy and will we face a potential another market crash? Uh, so, yes, I, I do think that we probably bounced back too fast too soon. Um, but again, keep in mind that, that the data that we were going off of when this was all unknown, that, that's the data or lack thereof that we had to go off of. So I think the market did respond in the fact that um, the, the data, the, the projections were worse, were, were not as bad as what we actually experienced. And that's why the market bounced back and bounced back quickly. But however, like I said, the S&P being up 37%, in in a month or so uh, yes I, I i do think there's a chance that we pull back um do i think that we're going to crash again like we did no i i don't see that coming um is, is there a chance that you know we have to shut this economy down again certainly it's a chance um do i think it will happen hopefully not uh, but i think that now that we've done it once it's probably easier to do um for for most states uh certainly for most businesses because people have gotten used to working at home um, businesses know that they they can have their employees work from home. You know they probably had measures in place to track the uh, the productivity and to see if productivity had fallen off at all. So I do think it's going to be a bumpy road um, for the time being. I think volatility will remain here uh, for a little while. I do think we'll probably experience some sort of pullback. I do not think we're going to see another 30, 40 percent pullback in the markets like we experienced back in March, though. Um, but could we see another five, ten percent pullback? Certainly. I mean, we looked at what happened uh, late last week, right? The market pulled back a uh, thousand points, and in, in the Dow pulled back a thousand points in one day. So I think that there are certain circumstances where, yes, we can, you know, pull back. Uh, maybe more of a. I, I talked about the W shape recovery earlier, and it's think about how a W looks, right? It, it drops massively, comes back somewhat, but we've we've come back fully. Right, almost the, the market has in that 37% increase. So kind of a combination in between that V and that W. But I do not see another huge crash coming. But Jason, if I, if I, I knew for sure, I, I, I had a crystal ball. Uh, Jason, before we pivot to maybe some retirement strategies, retirement plans, somebody did ask a question about what's your thoughts on the what they call robo-advisors and their role? Sure. Um, that, um, that's completely different kind of investing, um, than, than what we do. Um, at, as, as an advisor, I am, I'm not keen on, on the whole robo advisor, um, technology, but, you know, again, that's, I would say it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, but those are programs that are put in place. So, you know, it. To me, nothing beats the experience of talking to another person face to face. So, again, I, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with it, but that that's more technology based than human based. Okay, if you want to probably continue to the retirement portion, retirement plans. Sure, sure. All so, right, right. Yeah. So again, we'll we'll talk about um, IRAs. That was one of the topics on the uh, you know on the invite and. Let's start off with with IRAs, right? There's there's two different kinds of IRAs. Mainly, you have your traditional IRA and you have your Roth IRA. Um, there's similarities and differences with each. Um, with, with both IRAs, you are allowed to contribute for 2020. 
uh, $6,000 per year, uh, $7,000 if you're age 50 or over, which again, it's, it's not, for, it's not a huge amount of money per year to contribute, but if you're, you know, 22, 23 years old, and that money gets compounded over 30 and 40 years, you can certainly see a, uh, you know, a nice sum of money sitting in that retirement account by the time you're even allowed to touch that money, which on, in both cases, you can't pull money out of an IRA until you're at least 59 and a half. Uh, and if you do pull money out of your IRAs, either Roth or traditional, you are subject to a 10% penalty. So again, this is money that is invested for the long term, age 59 and a half. The, the difference between the two types of IRAs is a traditional IRA, your investments grow tax deferred. So any, any growth you see in any investment within that IRA, you do not pay any taxes on that growth until you actually pull the money out of your IRA versus a Roth IRA, that all grows tax-free. So any money you're putting into a Roth IRA, regardless of how much it grows, when you pull that money out and take your distributions, that is all tax-free, which is a huge advantage if that money's been sitting there for a very long time. Uh, another major difference is with your traditional IRA, the IRS mandates that you start taking what are known as required minimum distributions uh, at age 72. Now they just bumped that age limit up this year. Uh, so if you, it was age 70 and a half. So if you've reached age 70 and a half prior to 2020, that is still your RMD year. Um, but any, anybody who is not 70 and a half as of 2020, that year is, is age 72. Uh, Roth IRAs are not subject to required minimum distributions. And, and why is that an advantage? Because potentially if you have, you know, call it a couple million dollars in your traditional IRA and you reach that age 72, the IRS, there's a formula, there's an equation that, that they've set forth, requires you to take a certain amount of money out of that IRA every single year. And the larger your IRA, the larger the money you have, the larger sum of money you need to take out that can bump your, can keep you in a higher tax bracket, you know, when you're in retirement years versus a Roth IRA, there is no art, there's no required minimum distribution age. And again, that money's getting pulled out tax-free. So again, the major difference, oh, and the other thing to mention is with a traditional IRA, uh, you either the entire contribution or a portion of your contribution is tax deductible. Um, of course, what I'll say is my disclaimers, consult with your CPA or your tax advisor to decide if it's fully deductible or if it is uh, partially deductible, but that's also an advantage of, of the traditional IRA. But again, the major difference between the two, Roth IRAs grow tax-free, traditional IRAs grow tax-deferred. Um, what you can also do for maybe some of our more experienced investors that have uh, larger amounts of money in a traditional IRA is they can do what's called a Roth conversion. And what that is, is taking your traditional IRA and converting a portion of it or the entire amount to a Roth IRA. Now there's, there's one disadvantage to doing that. And then there's, you know, many advantages to doing it. The one disadvantage is the year that you make that conversion from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA is that the amount that you convert in that year, be it, you know, it's called fifty thousand dollars. Say you have a million dollar traditional IRA, you convert fifty thousand. Uh, that fifty thousand uh, is taxed at your ordinary income tax level today, right? So you have to, those taxes are due in the year you make that conversion. So again, whatever the amount is you convert, whether it's partial or the full thing, the amount you convert is taxable at ordinary income levels today. So again, you'll want to have you know some discretionary income laying around or savings laying around because Obviously, you're going to owe a nice sum of taxes on that money that you converted. Uh, the Jason, advantages, though, are enormous. Uh, depending Jason, on yes. Um, two questions coming up with the Roth IRA. Sure. What was so the Roth IRAs are tax up front, but with no. government national debt looming. No, wait, that, Frank, hang on. They're not. Okay. They're not taxed up front. You're contributing after tax dollars, so so money you've already paid taxes on to that Roth IRA, and then it's growing tax-free. Okay, but the, the question, if I get to the end, will say, but with national debt looming, Social Security fund shortfalls starting in 2034, is it possible the U.S. government could decide to tax you again? Could they change the law? Is that a possibility that tax you twice? I mean, is that, <laughs> is that law? I mean, I'm, 
he says it sounds political, but he just a question is, I guess any law can be made. I, I, Frank, I will say that anything is possible. I never would have thought it was possible that the United States could basically shut down. Right. And we did that. So is it possible? Probably do, do I know for a fact I, that that I, just, I don't know for sure, but I would say that anything is possible. OK, one right. follow up to this. Someone said, and I think we've talked about this before we started, but any recommendations on what company use for Roth IRAs? I think that will also go with potentially other questions going forward. What, I, I, sorry, I missed it. Any, 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 any recommendations on which companies to use for Roth IRA? Which companies? Yes. Yeah. Um, it, no, it, it doesn't matter what company. Like, so, for example, when you have a Roth IRA, um, and, and I apologize is if I if I misunderstand the question, you can have your Roth IRA, be it with Fidelity or Charles Schwab or Vanguard. That that doesn't matter who you have your Roth IRA with. What what the important thing is is what the investments inside that Roth IRA are, because no matter what firm you're with, and again, it, it could be anybody. Um, all the all the rules of the Roth IRA stay exactly the same. The difference is what the underlying investment within that Roth IRA is. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. You can go on. Okay. So what I was going to talk about was the, the Roth conversion and the advantages to doing a Roth conversion. We talked about again if if you convert. This year, the disadvantages you, you owe those taxes in, in this in this year, um, but the advantages are humongous. Uh, obviously, anything that you convert from a traditional IRA over to a Roth IRA that grows tax free. So, again, if you are, say, 50 years old and you, you do this Roth conversion, um, all of that money that you've converted, whatever portion you converted grows tax free. Uh, also, all of that money when you pass away will pass to your heirs or whoever the beneficiaries are on that Roth IRA. They're required to take distributions from that Roth IRA. However, all of the distributions they take are also tax-free. So once you've made that conversion, again, tax-free growth. Uh, one of the other advantages, as I touched on earlier, was that the IRS does not have required minimum distributions on a Roth IRA. So again, if you've made that conversion and you've converted our, pick a number, whatever the number is, from your traditional IRA to your Roth IRA, you no longer are subject to those required minimum distributions set forth by the IRS. So, again, when you're in your retirement ages, right, you're 59 and a half or older, you do not have to take that money out of your IRA unless you want to. So, you, you are not forced into a higher tax bracket. Um, and again, even if, even if you did want to take out a large sum, it's all coming to you tax free. So, those are the major advantages of, of doing a, a Roth conversion. Uh, again, the, the one downside is in this tax year, you would be subject to ordinary income tax. And the one thing you also want to consider is if you were to do a Roth conversion would be not bumping yourself up to a higher tax bracket this year. So that's why you, you kind of want to take a sit down with your CPA, you know, see, where, see what tax bracket you're in, see what the income limits are for tax brackets, and you know, contribute maybe up to the amount without bumping yourself into that higher tax bracket. If, if you want to go to the higher tax bracket, that's fine too. But always a consideration is that you can you can raise your tax bracket by doing something like this in the in the in the year you make the uh, conversion. So, um, that's again the, the conversion is more for probably our seasoned investors. Um, some ideas for some of our younger investors or, or recent graduates, um, what to take advantage of. I would say one of the main things you want to take advantage of when you start investing or when you first come out of school and you have that first job is, if possible, contribute to your company's 401k plan. Uh, a 401k works very similar uh, to, your, to the IRA, is that you're putting pre-tax dollars into that 401k and none of the growth in that 401k is taxed until you start to pull money out, which again, is no earlier than age 59 and a half. It is a retirement plan. That's what the money is set aside for, and that's the intended use of that plan. Um, and again, you're allowed to contribute $19,000 to a 401k in, in 2020. And I know that, again, when you're first coming out of school, maybe there's student loans you have to pay off, maybe you're saving for a house. So maybe you're not gonna contribute the full $19,000 every year to your, to your 401k, 
what I would recommend highly, if possible, is to contribute at least the maximum amount that your employer will match, right? So what does that mean? Your, your employer is going to have a company plan set up in place. There's going to be rules around that plan. And one of the, the rules written into the plan, and they're all different, might be that the company will match dollar for dollar. So they'll match 100% of the first 5% that you contribute, right? So let's just say that you're contributing you know, 5% of your salary to your 401k. Your company is going to match that same 5%. That's free money, right? So if you can afford to do that, I would highly recommend doing that. And again, if you're 22, 23 years old coming out of, coming out of college, and you can't touch this money till you're age 59 and a half, that's over 30 years of growth in that 401k, there's gonna be a nice nest egg sitting there by the time, by the time you retire. Uh, and the good thing about 401ks also, let's face it, we all don't stay at the same job our entire career. Uh, you have the option of moving that 401k to your new employer and investing in their plan, uh, or you can take the 401k that's in your, your old employer and roll that over into an IRA, a traditional IRA. Uh, the good news there is that that is a non-taxable event um, because you're going from a qualified plan to another qualified plan. So a huge advantage for, for individuals who are just starting out, uh, a good way to save money. Uh, you kind of put it on a systematic investment plan, meaning that the money just automatically comes out of your paycheck, goes into your 401k, and then it's almost kind of that set it and forget it mentality. Although what I would say is you want to continue to monitor the 401k, you want to rebalance your 401k um, to make sure that you're keeping up with you know, the proper allocations. But again, it's it's a good way to when you're coming out of school to start saving some money for retirement and get you know free money, quote unquote, from your employer if they have if they do have a match. Jason, before you move on, um, there's a question back to the IRA Roth conversion. Sure. Is there a penalty? In that conversion, is there a penalty similar to what they do when you take money out of your 401k? If you sure. convert a Roth IRA, is that what is, what is the penalty? Okay. Or you just there, pay there, the taxes. Right. There, there is no penalty to do the conversion. You just pay the taxes. However, okay, if you are under 59 and a half years old and you do the conversion and you take money out of the IRA to pay the taxes, you are subject to the 10% early withdrawal penalty. So that, that's why I kind of said earlier, if you have excess cash in a non-qualified account, and again, a non-qualified account is something, is, is this your traditional, could be your checking account, money market account, your brokerage accounts that are not, that are not retirement accounts, then, then it's a good idea to do it. But if you have to basically borrow the money from yourself or from your IRA, to pay those taxes, you will be subject to that 10% penalty, early withdrawal penalty. Okay, but if, second, if, second question here comes in, how do I get started with investing? I have a Fidelity account and I'm interested in passive income just to start from somewhere. Yeah, um, you know, with, with Fidelity, uh, you're pro this is probably a self-managed account, meaning that the, the individual asking the question is probably investing the money on their own. Um, you know, Fidelity has advisors that, that you can work with, or if you call the 1-800 number, you know, there, there is help that they, they can provide. Uh, the best way to get started is, is exactly, you know, what this person mentioned is they, they open up an account with Fidelity uh, and they, they can, if, if you choose to start investing on your own, you know, you, you pick some companies you like or pick some mutual funds you like, uh, some fixed, you know, maybe some bonds, depending on how diversified you want to be, uh, and you start investing. Um, one thing that it's a it's great discipline is instead of instead of having to write the check every single month is to get yourself on that systematic investment plan like I talked about with your 401k, where every month, you know, say hundred dollars or two hundred dollars or whatever that number is, just automatically comes out of your checking account and goes right into your fidelity brokerage account. Right. And that way that money's coming out every single month. And you can always change what that systematic investment is, whether you want to increase it or decrease it. But that's a good way to get started in the market because it's almost, it's a forced savings, right? That that's money that you're not going to be spending because you know it's going to come out of your account, out of your checking account, and going into your Fidelity brokerage account, for example. Okay. Follow up. You're using terms of of a 401k 
and a 403B. Can you tell me the difference and the similarities between both those accounts? Sure. Uh, they are essentially the same thing. Uh, a 401K is most of the times for-profit corporations have a 401K. Uh, a lot of times a 403B, you'll see that in, um, in schools, right? Or um, you know, in, in governments, they also have the, the thrift savings plan is, is referred to as a TSP. Uh, so essentially the 401k and the 403b, they act the same. It's just the tax code that they are, are um, qualified under. Um, but again, 403b, it acts just like a 401k. You have the same contribution limits as you do with a 401k. It's just a tax code. Um, and again, you can't pull money out of your 403b until you're 59 and a half. Um, so all the same rules and regulations basically apply as they do with, with a 401k. Okay. Yeah, you'll see 403Bs most of the, like I said, most of the time teachers will have a, a 403B. Okay. That's the most common. All right, yep. I, I, you can continue on to the next. Okay. Um, you know, that, that pretty much wraps up everything that I, you know, wanted to talk about. I mean, one of the things I know that, that Jenna had listed on the topic was different types of investments. So I can you know, pretty briefly go over that again, without getting into any specific recommendations. There's a number of different types of investments. Obviously you have your stocks, you have your bonds, you have your mutual funds. Um, and for our, you know, our newer investors, um, a mutual fund is basically a collection of stocks. Um, managed by by one manager, and a lot of times um, there's going to be a certain investment objective with that mutual fund. So maybe it's a large cap growth U.S. growth fund. What that mean is what that means is the market capitalization of the companies that 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 are inside that mutual fund are of a certain dollar amount, and they focus mainly on U.S. large cap. Or maybe it's going to be an international fund where the majority of the companies within that fund are overseas. Um, so, basically, a lot of times mutual funds are good for the investor that doesn't have um, an, enough of a nest egg right now to, to create their own collection of stocks. Uh, it's done for them, and it's a well-diversified portfolio. And the reason it gets tricky when, you know, with, with a little bit of money, with someone just starting out, is let's just say you buy, let's take Amazon, for example. And again, this is not a recommendation to buy or sell Amazon. But if you buy Amazon and Amazon is the only stock you own, right? Amazon's been on a terrific tear lately and it's continued to rise and rise and rise. Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, bad news comes out about Amazon and Amazon tanks, right? And you see that massive drop that we looked at in the very first chart. And that's just the only company you own. Well, your entire investment, you know, acts like that versus if you have a, a mutual fund or a collection of stocks and Amazon is one of the companies within that mutual funds, maybe Amazon is one of a hundred different companies in that mutual fund. If Amazon tanks, even if it is a 5% holding in that mutual fund, sure, the value of that mutual fund will decrease, but your investment will not decrease nearly to the amount that it would decrease if you were invested solely in that one company. So, um, you know, there's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, there's, Again, not to get too much um, into, into the weeds here, but alternative investments. Um, and again, this is for the more experienced investors um, with, with higher amounts of money. Um, there, there's private equity investments that you can get into. And again, this is money that's gonna be locked up for a much longer period of time. This, this, is, this is not money you wanna kind of get, get into the investment and get out of quickly. Much longer term holds. Um, there's a lot of times there's what's called capital calls in private equity investments where a certain portion of the money gets invested right away, but then they, they make a capital call and then you have to invest another portion of the money or the funds. So again, that's, that's where I'm much more experienced investors than, than the, the mutual funds or the individual stocks and bonds. So uh, one thing I'll say is always very important to consider when investing is your risk tolerance, right? And that, that means how aggressive or how conservative do you wanna be with your portfolio? And look, everybody wants to be a, everybody wants to be an aggressive investor when when the markets are doing well, right? Everybody wants to be in in the in the growth stocks and, and be aggressive because, you know, ultimately when you have higher risk, there's hopefully higher reward. And when the markets are doing well, everybody's everybody's happy. But when you take a look at what happened in March and, and in April at the stock market, 
uh, people get a reality check with their risk tolerance and people may not be as may not um, they may realize they're not as aggressive as an investor as they thought they were because that same investor that thought he was aggressive if he's calling and saying I need to get out of this market he never should have been in an aggressive portfolio in the first place so what you want to ask yourself is 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 important you know how would I feel if my investment was up 20 percent and everyone's going to feel great the bigger question is, how am I going to feel if my investment is down 20%? Nobody wants to lose money, but you know what they really have to ask themselves is, am I going to be able to sleep at night if I look at my portfolio and it went from $100,000 to $80,000 overnight? And I think that's the bigger question is, how much volatility, again, not how much risk, but how much volatility can you really stomach? Because remember, if if you if you real if you've lost money in the stock market but you didn't sell that investment you haven't lost money so to speak on paper you have but it's just volatility it's just the movement of your money right if you stick it out the hopefully the money will come back and the stock the stock market will rebound it may take longer than it took to go down but if you remain invested hopefully that investment rebounds so again Give yourself a reality check. Think about what your real risk tolerance is. And maybe you have different risk tolerances with different amounts of money. Obviously, retirement money, you might you have a much longer time horizon with that money if you're if you're newly out of school than you do if you're looking to buy a house with, with a certain amount of money, right? So if you want to buy a house in the next 10 years, that's a different time horizon with that investment than your retirement money if, if you're a new graduate. So those are, the, those are the kind of things to think about. Time horizon and risk tolerance play a very important factor in how you invest money. And again, it could be two different two different ideas for two, two separate pools of money. Jason, I have two questions coming in. One says, if you have a supplemental thrift with a Roth, because you can contribute to the Roth after retirement, but not to the thrift, mm -hmm. is the traditional Roth or the other one the supplement to the thrift if you want to contribute after retirement. So what Roth would you attach with a thrift that you want to make contributions after you retire is what the question is. Yeah. So um, I have to check the, and I, I can actually do that right now while we're talking. Hang on one second for me. I apologize for the break here, but um, so let, let me ask this question. If, we're assuming we're in retirement, so there is no no earned income. It just says that they can make a contribution to Roth after retirement. I assume that's what they're saying, Jason. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Again, I apologize for the uh, gap here. Hold on a second. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. Let me, let me get back. I said correct. Earned income on less part time work. No earned yep. income. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask. You, so again, it, depending on on age, also, if if you are seventy and a half or older, you cannot make regular contributions to a to a traditional IRA. So again, this is going to be age dependent. So again, if you're seventy and a half or older, you cannot contribute to a traditional IRA. And again. That's the age of where we're starting to, to see required minimum distributions. Uh, it's 72 now for 2020, but you are able to contribute to a Roth IRA if you are age 70 and a half or older. Okay. This, there's a follow up, there's a second question in there that says, is there a meaningful difference between a passively managed mutual fund and an exchange traded fund, an ETF? Yes. So an, e an ETF is exactly as, as the question just said, it's an exchange traded fund um, that follows a particular index. So, for example, if, if you buy uh, an ETF that that follows the S&P 500, that ETF is going to, you know, for the most part, mirror what that index does. OK, if you buy one that, that, that is um, mirroring the Russell 1000 index, that ETF is going to perform as that as the uh, index does versus a mutual fund where it may be benchmarked against the S&P 500. Um, again, you have a, a manager of that mutual fund actually picking the individual stocks that make up that, that mutual fund. So they do act differently 
in the sense that the, the ETF is going to almost mirror what the index does versus the, the mutual fund that may benchmark against that S&P 500 index. It all depends on what those underlying stocks in that mutual fund, what the performance of those particular stocks that that manager picked, uh, how they perform. So, yes, the, yes, there will be a difference. Okay. Thank you, Frank, for your help with that. The only other question that I saw come through that I don't think was answered, I apologize if you already did, but um, do you have to pay taxes or a penalty on the money you roll over from a 401k to a Roth IRA? Sure. So if you roll money, um, it, it depends. <laughs> if you roll money over from a 401k, and there are options within a 401k to do a, a Roth 401k, but let's just take the traditional 401k where it grows tax deferred. Um, if you roll money over from your 401k to a traditional IRA, there are no taxes or no penalties that have to be paid. However, um, if you were to take money from your traditional 401k, right? First, you'd wanna move it to that traditional IRA, so there's no taxes, no penalties. But if you then converted that money to a Roth IRA, the same rule would apply as the Roth conversions, where you would have to pay the taxes on the amount you converted from that traditional IRA, which was ultimately your original 401k, to the Roth IRA. So again, no penalty, um, but you do have to pay the taxes because you're going from a tax deferred retirement vehicle to a tax free retirement vehicle. Perfect, thank you, Jason. So we are now at one o'clock and I just wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, if you have more questions for Jason or wanna get in touch with him, his information is on your screen. We will also make sure to share that with the follow-up email that is sent out once the video is ready. So I just wanna thank you, Jason. I really appreciate how you broke down the terminology for people who might not be as uh, well-versed in the field as you are. So it was very easy for me to follow. So I appreciate that. Good, it's my pleasure. I appreciate you having me. Sure, and Frank, thank you also for helping to get all the participants' questions answered. That was a big help as well. Um, and make sure you follow the TU Alumni Association on our social media channels and on Tiger Connect, our alumni community. These details are posted in your window. We hope you can join us for another one of our live events and webinars. You can learn more about these events at alumni.towson.edu. This coming Tuesday, we'll be hosting another panel discussion on TU's ties to the Baltimore Stallions, moderated by TU alum Ron Snyder and author of the book, The Baltimore Stallions, The Brief, Brilliant History of the CFL Champion Franchise. He'll be joined by a group of four TU alumni who played major roles within the football club. So I can't thank you enough, Jason. I hope everyone today enjoyed this webinar and I hope to see you all again in the future. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks everybody.